All right, hi everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. We have a uh, excellent grand rounds for you today. Um, so I'd like to start things off with the introduction. So um, Rick Hodes is an American doctor who has lived and worked in Ethiopia for nearly 30 years. He's the medical director of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in Ethiopia, a 105-year-old NGO. He has been in charge of the health of Ethiopians immigrating to Israel. He has also worked with refugees in Rwanda, Zaire, Tanzania, Somalia, and Albania. Currently, he is the senior consultant at Mother Teresa's Mission, helping sick destitutes with heart disease, rheumatic and congenital, spine disease, TB and scoliosis, and cancer. He practices in the basement of a busy Addis Ababa hospital, concentrating on spinal deformities and rheumatic and congenital heart disease. A colleague recently said, Rick has the largest collection of the worst spines in the world. Hodes is a graduate of Middlebury College and the University of Rochester Medical School and trained in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins. Hodes first went to Ethiopia as a relief worker uh, during the 1984 famine. He returned there on a Fulbright Fellowship to teach internal medicine at Addis Ababa University and in 1990 was hired by the JDC as the medical advisor for the country. His original position was to care for 25,000 potential immigrants to Israel. In 1991, he was an active contributor during Operation Solomon, helping the Ethiopian Jews airlifted to Israel. In 2007, Dr. Hodes was selected as a CNN Hero, a program that highlights ordinary people for their extraordinary achievements. He was honored as ABC's Person of the Week in 2010. He is the holder of five honorary degrees and has been a uh, commencement speaker at Brandeis and UC Davis and University of Rochester Medical Schools. The American College of Physicians has awarded him Mastership and the Rosenthal Award for Creative Practice of Medicine. His work is subject of the HBO documentary, Making the Crooked Straight, as well as the book, This is a Soul, The Mission of Rick Hodes, by Marilyn Berger. A recent documentary, uh, Zemene, highlights the life of a young spine patient, her journey from rural Gondar to Addis Ababa, spine surgery in Ghana, and speaking in New York City. Rick lives with his family in Addis Ababa. And I believe Dr. Josen will give a little intro as well. Well, I'll keep it brief. So. Uh, there are many sides to Rick Hodes, one of which is he's a control freak. And he uh, emailed me the introduction. Hello, my name is Rich Josephson. I am the personal friend and colleague of Dr. Rick Hodes since we were interns in Baltimore. Before that, he had neither friends nor colleagues. <laughs> According to the great Dr. Harold Bornstein of New York, his health is astonishing, and he will be the healthiest doctor ever to speak at Case. I would like to deny reports that I asked Dr. Hodes to pay $130,000 out of his pocket for anything regarding my past, stormy or otherwise. <laughs> well, this goes on and on and on for another uh, page or two, and uh, I don't want to take away from Dr. Hodes' time. What I'd like everyone to do for a moment is just pause and think back to when you were applying to medical school. Think of what your hopes and aspirations were. Think of what you said during your interviews as to what you wanted to do as a physician after graduation. Now pause and think about what you're doing in your day-to-day -day work life today. Dr. Hodes has managed to remain true to his original ideals and frankly, each and every day does what I think most of us hoped and wanted to do with our careers. He does it full time, and he is a constant inspiration for me and frankly for everyone I know who have been touched by him. I don't want to take any further time. Rick, please come on up. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? No? Okay. Let's move this up. How's that? Can you hear that? I think I did. How's that? Can you hear that? How's that? Can you hear that? Okay. Thank you so much. It's great to be here in Cleveland. Um, I've been a doctor in Ethiopia for 30 years, and... I have a very unique practice, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, here's my disclosures. Do you want to turn the lights down? Is that possible? Okay, so um, this is what Sarah Palin calls the nation of Africa. 
And this is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the largest landlocked country in the world. We are 105 million people in an area about four times the state of Colorado. Uh, and there you can see uh, one third of the population, one third of the land and two thirds of the population lives in the Highland Plateau. There is no malaria. It's quite nice. Just a few statistics. This is about a year old. Um, 100 million people, 3% use the internet, 32% use cell phones. That's pretty good. Life expectancy is now up to 65. <clears throat> Measles immunization rate is 64%. Stunting is 44%. HIV rate is quite low. It's 1.2%. That's because, at least in part, the male circumcision rate is so high. Female circ circumcision is also quite high. 28% of the births are <clears throat> by skilled providers. Maternal mortality, in a woman's life, she has about a 4% chance of dying during childbirth. So that's still quite a problem. This is the Highland Plateau. It's really quite beautiful. Um, the country is two-thirds Christian, one-third Muslim. This is a rural Orthodox church. This is one reason you guys all should come to Ethiopia. This is called Lalibela. It's a dozen churches carved out of solid rock 800 years ago. From here to here, it's about 100 feet. To, to get down there, you go through this tunnel, and you go into this church, which is about four stories high, which is carved, at solid, carved out of solid rock. It's really quite amazing. Who does the carrying in Ethiopia? The, answer is, the quick answer is it's not the men, okay? It's the women, and it's the donkeys. Except for this guy who's carrying home the sheep. This guy has been fasting for 49 days, and he's bringing home the sheep to slaughter uh, for Easter. For those of us who fast on Yom Kippur, how do you fast for 49 days? Ethiopians fast, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians fast about half the days of the year, but they actually eat. During those days, they're vegans, though. And so what they call in Amharic and in Hebrew, Tzom, um, they are fasting, but they actually are eating. If you want to buy a chicken in the town of Gondar, you go to this guy. There's not a lot of castles in Ethiopia, or in Africa, but we got one. And here you see the, capital, the castle in the town of Gondor, which is about 120,000 people. This is a taxi in Gondor. There's other taxis as well. Oops. Okay. Um, so I spend a lot of my time at Mother Teresa's mission, and people just send me patients. So I got a call from a Catholic priest in the Somali area saying that he had a patient who looked like a Martian, could I treat him? Well, I, he, this is a guy with a PhD in Catholic theology, but he really didn't know how to describe things medically. So I said, send me a picture. So he sent me this picture, and here's this kid. And there you can see he has very, very thick skin. Any idea what this is? This is lamellar ichthyosis. So um, I had never treated lamellar ichthyosis before. Uh, what you need to do is two things. You need to moisten the skin, and you need to get them on retinoids. Fortunately, I have a branch that I can deal with in Bombay, and I can bring in retinoids from Bombay at quite a cheap price. Retinoids in America are quite expensive and very, very tightly controlled for very good reason because they're highly teratogenic. Anyway, we brought in retinoids. We gave this kid a bath twice a day. We put on Vaseline, and he actually turned into a kid. And there he is. I treated him for six months. I never could cannulate his skin to check his LFTs, so I was sort of flying by the seat of my pads. But it went okay. Here he is back in his village. There's the wonderful Christopher Hartley in the background. This guy came to us. I'm just showing you a bunch of different things because it's, I figured it would be interesting that you don't see this stuff here. This guy came to me, and he begged me to treat. And he, was, he had some sort of head covering on, and I couldn't exactly figure out, well, what's your problem? So I said, take this thing off. So here, this is a bit of a trick picture. This is one side of his face. This is the other, okay? So this is a condition, any idea? This is canker morris. This is Noma, uh, or canker morris. There's 120,000 cases in the world every year. Uh, it's a very big deal. There is a British charity which deals with this, and they come to Ethiopia twice a year, and they help our patients. So what you need to do there's an, one of the first uh, plastic surgery flaps. There's something called tagliacozzi. There's a tagliacozzi flap, and you can anastomose the forearm to the cheek. It's called a pedicle flap, and so we did that, not me, but the plastic surgeon did that for about a month and then reconnected things. And this guy, neither of us are beautiful, but we both can get by. This is a kid named Workina. I don't know where these numbers are coming from. Um, but <clears throat> this is uh, a kid who came in to Mother Teresa's I'm showing you, before I showed you, show you his hands, I'm showing you his x-rays. What does that look like? 
Okay, this is the bad hand. That's the good hand. And that's what this looks like. Now, I had never seen this before, and I'd never heard of this before. Um, there's two possibilities. There's certainly enchondromas, and the question is, are there also hemangiomas or not? If there's only enchondromas, it's called Olier's disease. If there's enchondromas and hemangiomas, it's called Mafusis. And it's a pathological difference. Anyway, this guy had only enchondromas. Um, I was able to send him to uh, California. There he is after surgery. He really did very, very well. And he goes once a year for touch-up. So we're about seven, eight years out. It affects the long bones to some extent, but his hands are much more functional. Um, this is a kid in Lalibela. There's a built-in water shortage up there. If you count the flies on his eyes, there's like 23 flies. So in the uh, villages, the prevalence of trachoma is very, very high. WHO recommends that mass treatment with azithromycin if the rate of trachoma is over 5%. And, you know, in the villages, it's well over 50%. So here I am at Mother Teresa's mission using my medical instrument, which is my Toyota car key, to avert the eyelid. You see these white punctate lesions? This is trachoma. So you treat this with azithromycin, 20 milligrams per kilogram, and they do very well. It stays in the conjunctival fluid for a month, and uh, they do fine. This guy is standing next to me in church in Lalibela, and you can see he just has pus um, coming out of his eye. He also has these very beefy uh, conjunctiva. He's a lot of inflammation. So I s turned to this guy. I speak Amharic, and I said to him, Ababa, which means grandfather, in a very, it's a very respectful term. I have some medicine for you. And I reached into my pocket, and I gave him two grams of azithromycin, and I said, here, take this. It's going to help your eyes. And he said, okay. And he swallowed. I gave him some water, and he swallowed the medicine right there. If I'm in synagogue and some guy can, comes up to me speaking broken English and saying, hey, man, take these pills. They're going to be good for you. I'm not sure I'm going to follow my advice, but uh, <clears throat> he actually did. This is a guy who came to me with juvenile Parkinson's. This is a 12-year-old with juvenile Parkinson's who supposedly is getting worse every month or two. The mother would just look at him and cry because he was deteriorating in front of her eyes. She took him to a neurologist. The neurologist diagnosed juvenile Parkinson's and didn't know how to treat him, and they came to me for a second opinion. Well, I took my digital camera, and I took this picture, and then I blew it up. Okay, what do you see? Yeah, so if you look, you see over here it's brown, and then over here it's sort of gray, and if you follow that around here, this is Kaiser Fleischerring. Okay, so this is Wilson's disease. Um, and I had never diagnosed Wilson's disease before, and up until that time, nobody had ever shown that you can actually show uh, Kaiser Fleischer ring with a cheap digital camera. Um, but in fact, I've done it twice now, and it actually, it actually works. I did bring a serum to New York. We checked his seroloplasmin. Normal seroloplasmin is, zero, is greater than 20. His was 0 0.5. So how do you treat uh, Wilson's disease? You need to chelate them. And you, the other thing is, you know, copper is plus two, so you give zinc because the body prefers to absorb zinc over copper. So one thing you can do is just give zinc tablets every day, and that's a cheap thing to do, but it's not enough. So one idea is you can give BAL, B-A-L, which is British anti-lewisite. It was invented by the British in World War, II, World War I um, as an antidote to nerve gas. Uh, and then you have to give either penicillamine or trientine. I was able to get trientine. Now there's a whole big thing because Teva cause controls the market for trientine and has <clears throat> jacked up the price significantly. But um, penicillamine also works. I also do oncology. Um, this is a boy named Muhammad who came to me with a bad lesion below his right knee. The same day I met him at Mother Teresa's mission, I met Temeskin. Temeskin had already lost his left leg. They both have osteosarcoma. One lost his right leg. One lost his left leg. They have the same shoe size. So I took this as a message from the Almighty that they belong together. I moved them into my house, and I'm giving them chemotherapy. Who's calling me? Uh, sorry. Um, I moved them into my house. I'm giving them chemotherapy on my front porch. The, the data on osteosarcoma is if you only amputate long-term survival, is 20%. If you amputate and you give chemotherapy long term, just with va basic stuff like cisplatin doxorubicin, long term survival will go up to 60%. With American chemotherapy, if you use etoposides and some of these newer drugs, 
you can get it up to 70 or even 75 percent. Anyway, I moved them into my house, and I'm giving them cisplatin doxorubicin. and you can see I'm covering the, the IV with tinfoil on my front porch. This is my youngest son who came out to uh, say hi to us. You can tell that it's a Sunday morning at our house because he wanted to eat, and he didn't want to wash a dish. So the way you can come up with more dishes is you can take the top of a pot and turn it over and uh, come up with a dozen new dishes that way. So that's how Messman is eating. Um, this is a thing, one of the things that you learn when you're practicing in Ethiopia is things present at a very, very late stage. So, for example, this is a guy who came to us with Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and I actually couldn't even do a biopsy. Nobody would touch him to do the biopsy, but it was getting bigger in front of my eyes. I figured this has to be a Burkitt's. And so I went shopping to the pharmacy to figure out what drugs were available so I could put together a chemotherapy. Uh, using uh, the help of a friend in Rochester, we put together this chemotherapy, starting off with cyclophosphamide, then Christine prednisolone. So you're starting cyclophosphamide 300, then Christine 1, and prednisolone 60, along with intrathecal methotrexate and hydrocortisone. By week two, we're giving cyclophosphamide 500, vincristine 2 grams, and prednisolone, and so on. So we started off a bit lower dose. Now, the problem is you're going, this is the kid one week later, okay? So you have to protect the kidneys. I didn't alkalinize the urine. I did give a lot of IV fluid um, and a lot of allopurinol. There he is. Then he, um, over the weeks, he developed chicken pox. He became Cushingoid. Here he is um, getting intrathecal chemotherapy at Mother Teresa's mission. Now, this is very easy to do. You just sit the kid up, no anesthesia. Um, you go in, you do it, pull out. It takes me 40 seconds to do the whole thing, and he did very fine. Here he is six months later when he finished. He has not relapsed. He's really done very, very well. This is another guy who came to us. This is a Hodgkin's disease. How do I know that it was Hodgkin's? University of Rochester kindly does my pathology for free, so I can actually take biopsies, get them to Rochester one way or the other. I never leave Ethiopia, by the way, without bringing body parts with me. And um, here he is. <clears throat> there he is. This is his initial chest X-ray, so you can see he has a lot of mediastinal involvement. There he is six weeks later, and here he is. So I used generic Indian drugs. It cost $1,000 to buy ABVD, adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastine, docarbazine, which is really one of the gold standards. And here this kid is six months later, so he really did very, very well. Uh, we have a lot of bone pathology in Ethiopia. I have no idea why. But, for example, this is a girl that came to us, Risku. She had a swollen leg for three months. You can see the tibia is all eaten up there. Uh, we amputated. Chest x-ray was fine. I gave cisplatin doxorubicin, and uh, she's doing fine. Her mom calls me once a year. This is a guy who came to me with testicular cancer. The problem with testicular cancer in our Ethiopian setting is that there's no plan B, like there's no salvage chemotherapy. So I contacted Larry Einhorn in Indianapolis, and I asked him, in this situation where there's no plan B, how should I treat this? Should I give a stronger initial chemotherapy? So he said, give three cycles of cisplatin, give a fourth cycle without cisplatin. That's what I did. Here he is. Um, he survived. He said, he's dictating a letter to another one of my kids, thanking his donors in America who raised $1,200 for his chemotherapy. This is what happens to your kids when they become teenagers even in Ethiopia. Um, I once heard something from a rabbi that directly describes the situation. He says that the reason that God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac at the age of 12 and not 13 is that at 13, it's no longer a sacrifice. <laughs> um, we have, this is a spleen. His white count is 255,000. Um, this would be very, very unusual in the United States, and we see this all the time in young people in Ethiopia. <coughs> okay, so, um, chromosome 22 is now attached to chromosome 9. So, this is a Philadelphia chromosome, and he has um, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Novartis will give us free imatinib, um, in these patients. And so it cost me about three or $400 to send the blood to Dubai to do the testing for the Philadelphia chromosome. And uh, <clears throat> once we show that they're Philadelphia positive, 
we get reimaginative for life. And here you see this kid is two years later. Um, so saving a life for 300 bucks is really quite a great deal. This is a girl that we call Miss Ethiopia because she's so beautiful. Uh, but that's her heart, okay? Um, you don't have to be a cardiologist to know that this is uh, <clears throat> pretty bad. This is wide open mitral regurgitation. We see this all the time. In America, the natural history of rheumatic heart disease is once you have rheumatic fever, about 20 years later, you need valve replacement. This is a girl who's 10 years old, and she already has a heart like that. Um, was able to get her out of the country, and there she is after her valve replacement. And we can keep, can keep on following her, and she does well. I, I bring in, there's, there's a great shortage of warfarin in Ethiopia. I bring in warfarin from Atlanta, where I can buy it in bulk for about 10 cents a tablet. And um, Henry Schein donates the testing equipment so that we're able to provide free warfarin and free INR testing for our patients. This is a guy who came in with a blood pressure of 190 over 130. That's his chest X-ray. Here's a blow-up of the chest X-ray. Okay, anyone want to tell me what this is? Yeah, do you see that? Looks like a middle, little mouse is nibbling away. Okay, so that's, uh, that's rib notching. The only thing that causes rib notching is neurofibromatosis and coarctation. So this is coarctation, and um, clearly this guy needs treatment because it was very, very difficult to control his blood pressure, and he really wasn't feeling well. So then um, I'll, I'll tell you what I did with these patients in a minute. This is just another interesting heart patient. There's a kid named Aquak. Aquak came to me with a bad back. Let me see. What's, okay, I, I thought I had better slides. But anyway, you can see he has a fusion of some of these vertebrae here. Um, and he has a funny chest X-ray. So he has a lot of stuff on the left, and he has a lot of vascular markings here. You see an air bronchogram, and you don't see much on the right. You don't see much on the left. So here's the patient, okay? So he came to me, and he said, I have a bad back. But from the front, he looked fine. He's missing a thumb. And from the back, he has three problems. He has a lumbar kyphosis. He has a discrepancy of his scapula, and he had a thoracotomy scar. So I said to him, well, what happened to your chest? And he said, when I was five years old, I had patent ductus arteriosus surgery at the, at the hospital, and they closed my PDA, and now I'm okay. So <clears throat> the only problem is I'm an internist, and I actually know how to listen to hearts. And so when I listened to his heart, it sounded like he had the machinery murmur of PDA. But I knew this couldn't be a PDA because that had been closed. So I said to my assistant, I have no idea what I'm listening to. Let's get an echo. So I get the echo. The echo shows, number one, huge PDA with left to right shunt. Number two, inadvertent ligation of the left pulmonary artery. Okay, so this is a kid, yeah. So this is, this is a kid who went to the hospital to get patent ductus surgery, ended up um, without a pulmonary artery. Now, remember, the blood supply to the lung is not the pulmonary, it's a lung parenchyma. It's not the pulmonary artery, it's the bronchial artery. So his lung parenchyma should be in good shape. The question in there, you can see that. Um, so the question is, um, are his levels of pulmonary hypertension too high, and is this irreversible? I was able to get him free surgery at University of Colorado. I brought him to Denver. They cast him. Um, his levels of pulmonary hypertension decreased with oxygen alone, and so they did really nice surgery. They ligated the PDA, and they made a new pulmonary artery out of his pericardium, um, something that you don't do every day. And he actually did very, very well. Now, it's, it's interesting. Denver is actually used to this because one of the risk factors for um, high-altitude pulmonary edema is unilateral absence of a pulmonary artery. So... Um, Every year, somebody gets off the plane in Denver, Colorado from Miami and goes into high-altitude pulmonary edema, and they work him up, and they find out he was born without one of his pulmonary arteries. So the Denver surgeons are actually somewhat adept at doing this, and uh, he did very, very well. But then he had – so then I sent him to Ghana, and uh, there – okay. This is, his, this is his spine after that. So you can see um, – he has a pretty bad deformity, and he's now 13 years old. He's going to deform for another four and a half years as he's still growing. And so you can see if that is your spine now, what, you're, what are you going to look like when you're 17? So then I sent him to Ghana, 
and my surgical partner there, Dr. Boachi, removed L1, L2, and L3, um, which is a very, very major surgery. Not many surgeons in the world would feel comfortable doing that, and he did very, very well. Okay, um, to end up hearts, I went heart hospital shopping, and I found a great hospital called Ames Amrita Hospital. It's a Hindu hospital in Cochin, and I send my patients to uh, Cochin a couple times a year. In order to get a mitral valve um, replaced in Cochin, it costs about $5,500. In order to get a mitral valve um, ballooned open, it costs about $1,400. To get a coarctation stented, it costs $1,400. Um, and so I send these tetralogy surgery, and we do tetralogies a couple times a year. I also get teenage tetralogies literally walking into my office. They're walking slowly, but doing okay. And um, we send them to Ghana, and uh, the bill for a group like this would be about $60,000. Uh, I'm not sure you can get a hysterectomy in Cleveland for that, but uh, in Ghana you can get a lot more. So... My life changed completely in 1999. I was working at Mother Teresa's mission one day, and these two boys were admitted. These are abandoned orphans um, with no known relatives living in the room for sick children who were not put up for adoption with TB of the spine. So this is POTS disease. And Semenya on the left had a 120-degree angle. Uh, Dijani on the right had about a 100-degree angle. I knew that it was a question of time before they deformed to the point that their spine would be um, <clears throat> compromising their spinal cord and they would become paralyzed. If you become paralyzed in Ethiopia, you become incontinent, you get pressure sores, life is terrible, um, and then you die. So I wanted to avoid that. And I tried to get them free surgery. And I tried and I tried and it was impossible to get them free surgery. So then I got this brilliant idea that I would adopt them add them to my health insurance, bring them to the United States, and get them surgery. Now, the only problem is when you adopt an abandoned orphan who doesn't have any relatives, they become yours for life. Um, so I thought about this, and the Almighty sent me a message saying, do it. So I went ahead and I adopted them, and I added them to my health insurance, and I brought them down to Dallas, Texas. Here they are after their surgery in Dallas. Um, whoops. This is me and Jenny balancing each other. This is a real picture. Um, we sent this to a spine surgeon with a caption, Spinal Stress Test Successful. If you ever want to, if you ever want to try this with your brother or your kid, uh, the person in my position has to weigh about 20 pounds more than the other one. Um, and then I started getting more and more spine patients. So, for example, this is a kid named Ashinafi. Uh, this is fairly recent. This guy came to me. The unique thing about Ashinafi is that he has two apices. Usually TB has one apis, apex. And here you can see that he has a big problem. You can see that is crushed and that is crushed. Um, we treated him for TB. We actually wanted to send him to Ghana and put him into traction, but there were logistical issues. He was an orphan. We couldn't get him a passport in time. So I just treated him. And here... Uh, he actually did very, very well, and he's feeling well. This is a typical, typical girl with TB of the spine. So they come to you like that with a 90-degree angle. That's the spine. Here you can see the cord is just about to start getting compromised. And here she is. She's 13 years old. She hasn't started menstruating yet. She's going to go into her growth spurt. She's going to deform more, and then she's going to become paralyzed. So I sent her to Ghana, and in Ghana they, they removed um, a couple of vertebrae, and they straightened the spine, and she did very well. Here's another example. This is a boy named Ramadan. Ramadan came to us like that. Now, you can see these TB patients, TB does not cause scoliosis. TB causes kyphosis. So he has zero scoliosis. But then you see that thing up there? Okay. What's that? I showed this at Stanford, and somebody said it's an air fluid level. This is a kid who's not sick. This is a kid who's walking around slowly playing soccer with his friends. So he's not, it's not like he has a pulmonary abscess, okay? But this is his spine, okay? So the spine is horizontal. You're looking into the spinal canal. Okay, so it's horizontal for like seven levels, and then you have this acute angle. So what you need to do is you need to remove these vertebrae, and that's called a VCR, vertebral column resection. It's a very big deal to do. It's possible. Um, my surgical partner, Dr. Boachi, does them every week, and so we sent them to Ghana, and he had VCR done. You can see that he has a cage um, 
replacing, um, putting space between the vertebrae that are left, and he did very, very well. This is a typical kid who came to us. This is a kid. I'm going to put myself in this position. So this is a guy who's standing in front of us. His right hand is below his right knee. His left hand is above his left knee, and he's, I'm going to try to straighten my back, and it really doesn't straighten. So if you're in that situation, um, what, is, what is your spine going to look like? And you see, that's what his spine looks like, okay? So he really, his spine is like a question mark. You see that? So it's really like a question mark. We sent them to Ghana. Um, okay, so here we are with Mother Teresa looking over our shoulder. Um, I'm no giant, and this guy is a lot shorter than me. But look at this. Our waists are about the same. So we basically have the same legs, but he has about 40% of my chest. And if you look at that, his FVC is 39%. So he's lost 61% of his lung function. So then I sent him to Dr. Boachi in Ghana, and here he is, whoops, here he is um, in the three months that he was in Ghana, I've shrunk about six inches, and uh, he's doing a lot better. And he ended up with three rods. Most of my patients end up with four rods. If you only need two rods, you really don't need me as a doctor. Uh, we end up on the average with four rods, and we go up to as many as seven, if that's necessary. So this is the thing that's changed our lives completely. Um, this thing called traction. You know you go to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor says, which, which image looks better, A or B? So that's A, whoops, and that's B. So that's A, and that's B. Okay, so this is a very flexible patient. You can do traction on anyone, except it's a lot easier if they're flexible like this. So then... We send them to Ghana, we drill four holes in their skull, and we put them into ambulatory traction. This is something invented in Texas about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so this is a, a spring system. This is a pressure gauge. You start off with five pounds of pressure. You go up to about half their body weight over a three to four week period. What do we do as human beings all day long? We sit, we stand, we lie down. So we're stretching them 23 hours a day. We're sitting them, we're stretching them when they sit, we stretch them when they stand, and we stretch them also when they sleep. That's what it looks like from the top. Um, and this is a typical scene in Ghana. So this is a traffic jam in the morning. Before it gets too hot, the first 90 minutes, the last 90 minutes of the day, kids get into their, tra their traction apparatus, and they're walking around like this. And you can see, it really, you think it'd be very painful. It hurts for the first 24 hours. After that, it really doesn't hurt. It often actually feels better, they say. So here, this is standing traction. This is sitting traction. So these are world's record pictures because nobody else on the planet is using traction to the extent we are. And let me show you the, what traction can do. So this is a kid whose name is Sintayo. Sintayo came to us like that. Okay, he has a right-sided scoli. This is the CT reconstruction of his spine. So this is really, really bad. Okay, and again, you can compare the two of us. You can see this guy should be a bit taller than me. Um, now, look at his hands. His patella is here. One of the things I've found is when your hands, I'm interested in the relationship between the hands and the knees. When your hands touch your patella, you've lost 50% 50, 50 of your force vital capacity. So I, I look at the hands, I look at the knees, and I, look at, I estimate the FVC on the basis of that. And we're pretty good at this point of just estimating FVC. Um, here, his FVC at this point was 18% predicted. It's 0.68 liters. So his entire force vital capacity, the total amount of air he could breathe out, is two cans of Coca-Cola. So we sent him to Ghana, put him into traction. for. Now, you can't operate on somebody like this because they're, you're not going to be able to get them off a ventilator. But once you expand their lungs and you do lung training, um, they do a lot better. So here he is after four months of traction, and there he is during his surgery. Okay, he ends up with five rods. He's had a VCR as well. He had a complicated course, but uh, he ended up doing very well. And again, you can see the, the height that we've restored to him. This in America, well, there's not many places in America that actually can do this surgery, but uh, this would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially with traction. In Ghana, it cost me $20,000. So I have to raise $20,000 for every, each of these patients. If you know of anyone who uh, has won the lottery or knows Bill Gates, please 
refer them to me. Now, one of my major, major problems is NF, neurofibromatosis. Neurofibromatosis, um, I'm just going to review for you because it's something that we deal with every day. 5% of my patients have neurofibromatosis. It's really terrible. Um, the data on F, NF is that like 25 or 30 percent of neurofibromatosis patients will have spinal deformities. In my case, they're coming to me for spinal deformities, so it's 5 percent of my patients, and it's maybe even more if my theory is correct. But um, the, the data in the population is one in 3,000. It's uh, autosomal dominant. You see, cap, you see cafe au lait spots, and you see optic gliomas. This is a girl who came in, um, and this is a giant plexiform neurofibroma. We don't see this that often, but I've seen several. We just operated on one this past week. Um, these can degenerate and become a sarcoma. We did four biopsies to make sure that there was no um, sarcomatous element to it, and then uh, a visiting plastic surgeon removed the whole thing. Okay, this is a girl who came to us. She came to me last year, the Saturday before Easter Sunday. And I, you know, my staff is Christian, and I said, should we work the Saturday before Easter Sunday because you guys are preparing your Easter chicken, which is what they eat on Easter. We decided to start to start open to open up and see if anyone showed up, and then we would close early if nobody came. So it's interesting. The Christians, Ethiopia is one two thirds Christian, one third Muslim. The Christians stayed home that day, but the Muslims came because it was a normal day for them. And um, this girl was carried in, beautiful girl. Okay, you can see her dad carrying her in. You can see that she has neurofibromatosis. The story is, several weeks before, she woke up paralyzed. So I immediately called my scanning center, and I have a wonderful Christian hospital that does my um, CAT scans for free. I drove her down myself. This is her CAT scan. Okay, so this is her spine. It's going down, it's going up, and it's going down again. So this is a completely dislocated spine. Okay, you shouldn't see two cervical vertebra parallel to each other, ever, ever, ever. Um, so this is a girl whose lifespan is extremely short, and um, things were terrible. So we, we made an emergency trip to Ghana with her. Here she is in traction, sitting traction, lying down traction, standing traction. You can see she's wearing diapers because she was incontinent. Um, after three months of traction, Dr. Bwachi operated, instrumented her. She's now walking. She's continent. So we've actually given her back her life. Um, so this is, and we have several of these a year. This is a guy whose name is Lameskin. We're discovering these new deformities. This is what's called a gamma spine. He came to us. He was spastic. He was myelopathic. Um, his knees were... Hyper, um, hyperactive, he had sustained clonus, and he had bilateral upgoing toes. Okay, so here he is, and there's his back. Okay, this is a very unique lesion for those of us who see backs from the back all the time. So you can see, if you look at this, it looks like an alpha, doesn't it? Let me show you what his spine looks like. So the spine is going down, it's going across. Here you're looking into the spinal canal, and then it goes down again. Okay, so this is the spine. Okay, this is what's called a gamma deformity. Uh, these are very, very challenging. Um, we sent him to Ghana, we put him into traction, and um, he had surgery, he did not do well. He ended up, he ended up um, becoming paralyzed. If you become paralyzed in surgery, many times over the next year or so, you will become um, unparalyzed. But anyway, he ended up dying, unfortunately. But uh, you can see, this is the challenge that we face. Now, if you look at that, okay, so if you're drawing a line across there, here you're looking into the spinal canal from the side, and look at this. You're looking at the spine across the abdomen, and you have two vertebra at the same level in opposite directions. So we're actually, we're describing some of these new lesions and this is one of them. Okay, this is a guy named Abraham who just came in the other day. This is called an alpha deformity and you can just see he has an unbelievable spine. Um, 
So the question is, what's the natural history of this? Are they going to get better um, with surgery? Will surgery paralyze them? Would they become paralyzed without surgery? We really don't know the answer, and there's a lot of discussion about what to do here. Uh, this is a, an easy case. This is a floppy kid who came to me whose mother said he, he's lost the ability to walk over the past two months. I did this image. We found um, <clears throat> spinal cord compression. So this is a spinal cord tumor. This is easy. We sent him to Ghana, and uh, he did fine. So I started my spine program in 2006. 2006, we got 20 new spines. By 2015, we're getting 445 new spines a year. 2006, we did 11 surgeries in one country. Now we're doing over 100 surgeries in at least two or three countries every year. And we're discovering this stuff that has never been seen before. For example, this is a kid whose name is Deguala. Deguala came in. It's a beautiful picture. This is at Mother Teresa's mission. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And so I went ahead and I imaged him. There you can see a very, um, very thin kid. And I did a chest X-ray, and he had this amazing chest X-ray that I had never seen before. Um, anyone want to take a guess? There's only two things that people came up with about what this might be. What? No, no. One is that nobody suggested thymoma. One is extramedullary hematopoiesis. The other, there's something called nut NUT midline carcinoma. There's 60 cases in the world, but this could be a nut midline carcinoma. I went ahead, you can see it's not an anterior lesion. Then I did an MRI, and we have this amazing thing that nobody, the Cleveland Clinic Radiology Department had never seen anything like this. Um, and you can see this is a septated lesion um, that we had no idea what we were dealing with because this has never been described. We actually put in a needle and used gene expert, and this is mycobacterium tuberculosis sensitive to rifampin, we treated for TB, you can look at that. And he did, he did fine, he actually did very, very well. Um, and I keep on following him. This is a kid named Eob who came in, Eob said, I have a bad back. So I said, take your shirt off. And he said, I've been to 25 doctors and nobody knows what's wrong with me. So I said, I sort of said to myself, well, I'm not gonna know either, but let me take a look. So here he is a nice looking kid from the front. But he is, his arms were in this unusual position. They were sort of, he didn't have a lot of flexibility. And from the back, he had these sort of ridges that I had never seen before. He came in with this x-ray, and you can see, I mean, you've seen Sintayo's x-ray that looks like uh, the Nile River. This is just a bit of an arc, it's not so bad. But then I said, well, what is this thing here? And then if you look from the side, I said, well, what's that, and what's that, and what's that? So I said, I just wanna see what's going on. And so I brought him to an x-ray place, I lied him down, and I got a flat plate of the abdomen, okay? This is his abdominal flat plate without contrast. Any idea? So, I had no idea either, but fortunately Al Gore invented the internet, and so I was able to send out this to a bunch of people uh, this is something called FOP, Fibro Dysplasia Ossificans Progressiva. Uh, it's a mutation on chromosome 2. Um, it is autosomal dominant, although these people don't generally reproduce. And um, they develop a second skeleton. There's 600 cases in the world. There's a guy named Fred Kaplan at the University of Pennsylvania. Fred has become, he's an orthopedist who became a scientist. He discovered the gene. There's drug trials now and so on. So this is this kid, and I keep on following him. I've now had two subsequent cases, so I now have three cases, <clears throat> three out of the 600 on the planet. And you can see he continues to deteriorate. Uh, this is a CAT scan that I did, and you can see his extra bone growth here. Also, you see this type of thing. This is the type of bone growth that they get. Now, the key to making the diagnosis is the big toe. Okay, so Fred didn't say, send me a blood sample, do a DNA something. He said, send me a picture of the big toe. And so, as part of my spine workup, I take three pictures of the feet of every spine patient. So I sent him this picture. He said, oh yeah, this is, pa this is pathognomonic. So FOP, watch the great toes. They always have an abnormality of the big toe. 
Um, this is one of the things we've learned. This is a girl who came to us. Ignore that. I don't know what that means. It's not a hairy patch. This is just an arched spine. But this girl with a very mild spine has progressive weakness. She has four plus knee jerks and an upgoing toe with a spine like that. So one of the things that we've realized is that these patients um, do not really have a spine problem. It's often a, it's a CNS problem. We did an MRI and you can say you can see that this patient has a syrinx the size of the Mississippi River. Um, the patient was then had the syrinx drained and instrumented, and she's doing much much better now. Um, <clears throat> these are the type of patients who come to Mother Teresa's. We got this kid. This is a sacral coccygeal teratoma. This will become malignant at this kid's age, which is eight months. It has a 20% chance of being malignant. So you want to remove these sooner rather than later. So you remove the tumor, you remove the coccyx, and you can see the kid, the kid ended up doing fine. Okay. This is a kid who came to us. We'd never seen this before. Um, this kid just looks like a Martian. Okay, so it looks sort of hard there and spongy there, and I was wondering about thalassemia. This is not a thalassemia. Uh, and you can see there's the brain, and then there's all this extra tissue. This was read by the radiologist as neurofibromatosis, but it's actually not neurofibromatosis. Um, there's something next door in Sudan called Madura foot. Madura foot is some sort of fungus of the foot, and I say some sort because there could be several fungi that cause it. This is actually Madura head. This is actinomycosis of the head. Um, and so you treat this. There's one world's expert who kindly held my hand, and we treated him with long-term Bactrim and cycles of amicacin, and he actually did quite well. This is a girl who came to us um, with another one of these crazy tumors. This is something that Ethiopian, you see in Ethiopia all the time, usually not to this extent, but it's the type of thing that Ethiopian doctors all know about this. And American internists, this would not be in our vocabulary. Um, but this is actually a tumor of the dentin. Okay, this is a non-malignant tumor of the dentin. It's called amyloblastoma. Um, this is the world's biggest amyloblastoma. Um, this is what the patient looks like. This is the patient at Mother Teresa's mission. And I was able to bring her to Munich, Germany. Oh, there's her CAT scan. Okay, so you can see the tumor is a lot bigger than her skull. Um, the, actually, the ramus was okay. So they're able to keep the rami, and they removed the whole mandible. They built a new mandible out of, uh, this is a computer model. So this is the patient's ramus. These are, this is the new mandible. They did not use the second level. Um, and the patient turned out very, very well. Um, so now we have teams coming and we try to arrange surgery for these poor people so that they can go on with their lives. This woman who was shut in for years and embarrassed to go on the street, she's now a housemaid for a German diplomatic family living in Geneva, Switzerland. So this is my waiting list of patients. And I'll close with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt and take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Hood. Do you have any questions for Dr. Hood? You, you did your internal medicine at Johns Hopkins? Uh, we were together in Baltimore City. Baltimore City? Yeah. So how much of what you learn in your residency do you use in Ethiopia? Um, As a residency director, I thought I'd ask that question. Yeah, that's actually a very good question because, I mean, like, I didn't learn anything about TB of the spine, yeah. you know, and now I literally have seen a 1,000 cases. Yeah. Um, treating congestive heart failure? Yeah. That? I mean, well, the thing is, you can learn, that, you know, like I did one month of oncology at Johns Hopkins Hospital on the solids wards, and now I do oncology, you know, and I can treat Hodgkin's, I can treat osteosarcoma, I can treat Ewing sarcoma. It's not difficult to do this stuff. I mean, with all due respect, you don't need to be a genius to be an oncologist. Um, <laughs> And, and I, you know, I mean, I, I'm just saying that in the fact that if I can do it, you can learn this. You can learn how to do it. It's not. It's not difficult. Other questions or comments? So, on the average, how many patients are you seeing daily, and 
mix besides your spine focus? So I see about, say, 20 patients, 25 patients. I see patients five days, five afternoons a week from Tuesday through Saturday. Um, on the average, maybe 20 to 25 a week, uh, a day. Um, on the average, I'll get two or three new patients a day, maybe two hearts, now two spines and one heart. Uh, the hearts are usually rheumatic or congenital. Um, the spines would be, it's one-third TB, um, and then some congenital kyphosis, 5% are neuromuscular, which is old polio, neurofibromatosis, and so on. Um, and then I just, you know, people come in with these crazy rare diseases that nobody else, they just hear about me. I mean, also I get these terrible cases. You know, you get kids with um, spina bifida, meningocele, and things like that who think that, you know, th this American doctor can cure their kid. Yeah. Uh, so especially short-term American, like, doctors going overseas for medical work is often criticized because um, in long-term continuity. Um, for those of us, I think what you do is great and obviously very personally rewarding. For those of us who might be interested in, in shorter-term um, overseas work, do you have any comments on how we can actually make a positive change instead of just kind of doing something that might be personally gratifying but might not make a big difference? Uh, and obviously, I don't know what your field is. You know, if you're general internal medicine, probably the best thing you could do would be to go over and teach something about hypertension or diabetes or some of these other things that Americans get good at. Um, you know, if you're a spine surgeon, obviously there's, there's other things that you can do. But I would, I would certainly try to have a teaching component to it as well so you're not just practicing because it's nice to be able to leave these skills behind. Any other comments or questions? If not, I want to thank Dr. Josephson for, for Bring me you here. Thank That's you. That's a fair statement. And, and thank you for a really fascinating presentation. Really greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.